So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about the microbiome and whether you can eat yourself healthy. And, you know, I was trying to come up with a title, and as you can see, there were a few attempts at that when you saw the original draft slide deck. <laughs> um, and if I'm honest, quite a lot of my talk is going to be about poo. So, this is really the title of my talk, The Wonderful World of Poo. You have no idea how much poo we have in my lab. We have a lot. <laughs> Just so you know. And the reason that I am talking about poo and the microbiome is now more than ever, we are being assaulted with headlines and self-help sites and websites and programs suggesting that the microbiome is the core of a whole host of conditions. And if we could only change our microbiome, we would be well, we would be less anxious, we would sleep better. And the industry in making things that can change our microbiome is absolutely huge. So I just pulled these off the internet last week, but there are many, many, many more. So before I go any further, what is the microbiome? It is the collection of organisms that lives inside you, but also on you. And that is a mixture of viruses, yeast, fungi, even some parasites, and of course, bacteria. And it's the bacteria that we know the most about. So most of the research is currently on bacteria. And the number that I'm showing you of 38 trillion is the number that has been suggested to be the average number of bacteria living on one person. So each one of you has 38 trillion bacteria. That's big, but we have 7.6 billion people on the planet. So if I was to draw the 7.6 billion to scale compared with one of your sets of bacterial populations. Let's have a look and see what happens. Can't even see it. We, we're dwarfed by our bacteria. And because we can have fun with numbers, let's see how many bacteria we have on everybody in the planet. It's a lot, isn't it? I think it's 2.9 times 10 to the 23. I did have to check the zeros quite a lot. So it's staggeringly huge how many bacteria we have living inside us and on us. And they are doing so many crucial things for our health. They're so diverse. And just to illustrate how diverse and different they are, I'm going to show you this art piece here. This is an, um, done by an artist, Mel Fisher. And what she does is she makes agar sculptures that enable her to then seed her own bacteria onto them. And you can see on this one here, you can see a whole host of different colors and shapes of bacteria. And if she uses a different part of her skin or a different agar mix, she can get another collection of microorganisms growing on her sculpture. So that gives you a little taste of just how varied those microbes are. They're doing amazing things. They're protecting us from infection. They're shaping and developing our immune system. They're even helping us digest our food and making vital vitamins we couldn't otherwise make. On a mundane level, we have this. They reduce how much we fart. Everybody farts. But we'd fart more if we didn't have gut bacteria. Just so you know. And if you can light your farts, that's because of your gut bacteria too. Certain types of gut bacteria make flammable gas. Not everybody can do it, so please don't try it at home. <laughs> and why are we so excited about the bacteria? Well, they are able to confer superpowers on us. One example is here. This is a desert rat. As you can imagine, it lives in the desert, and there isn't really a great deal of food for it to eat. But something that grows well is the creosote bush, which is a very toxic plant. If it were to eat it normally, that would kill it. However, it can eat it very, very comfortably, which is good because it's the most common type of food it's going to get. And it turns out that it's all to do with its gut bacteria. 
its bacteria can break down the poisons and make them safe. If you give the rat antibiotics, it can't eat the plant anymore, it will be killed. So that's pretty amazing. People have even looked at the difference in obesity. So here we've got, I think you can guess which one it is, we have a very obese mouse, and it has a vastly different gut bacteria to a thin mouse. And if you do an experiment where you take a mouse that is genetically likely to get fat, and you give it the microbiome of a thin person, that mouse doesn't get fat, it stays thin. If you give the thin one the microbiome of a larger person, it puts on weight. So that suggests, again, that the microbiome can do things that might be able to change our biology, and they can do things that maybe we can plug into. And I think that's the type of thing that's led to this explosion in interest in changing the microbiome. So there's two main things that are done. And do you know what this is? This is an enema kit. Old and new. They haven't changed much over the last 300 years. And essentially, um, there are some people, I won't name them, but you know who they are, Gwyneth, who tell you that you should flush out your toxins by having an enema. This will damage your gut, it will remove the layers of protection in your, blood, your gut and also remove a lot of your microbiota. So I wouldn't really recommend it. Another approach uses one of these. It's called a fecal microbial transplant. Basically, you get the poo sample of the person you're interested in. <laughs> Do I need to go further? Pop it, in the, pop it in the blender and you make a smoothie. Usually it is administered using something like the enema kit. You usually don't drink it. And there are self-help sites that tell you how to do this. It's becoming a thing. Also, by the way, by the way don't buy a second-hand blender. <laughs> now, it may be becoming a thing, but is it a good idea? Apart from the obvious ick factor. So, unless you know the somebody's been screened before they give you your poo sample, you're really, really putting yourself at risk of an infection. Also, there is another thing that we need to point out. It's poo. Now, I know it's poo. Poo does contain microbes. It contain the right microbes. If we look all the way down our gut, we can see real variety in the types and numbers of microbes that we've got. The stomach has much less, all the way through to the large intestine, which has a really rich, diverse population. And so is a poo sample really capturing that diversity? And if you actually have a look at how the gut is laid out, what I've got here is my big science slide. If I had a pointer, it would be a little easier, so I'll try and talk you through it. On the left-hand side, I have a picture of a gut biopsy. And what we've done is we've stained the section so that you can see the, the host cells, our own cells, our intestinal cells, in blue with little green blobs. And then on the right-hand side, you should be able to see a kind of mixture of red and green in that image. And I've put a little cartoon at the side of it to explain what everything is. And basically, the epithelial cells, the cells that line our gut, are making mucus, just like the mucus in your nose, the snot in your nose, and that acts as a barrier to prevent against infection. There also is this thick layer of mucus, and a lot of our bacteria quite like living in there. You then get a further population of bacteria that live just outside that mucus layer. Now, we and others have analyzed poo samples and compared them to the bacteria we find in the mucus. And the two populations are very, very different. So this poo sample is not telling us what's in the mucus. And we've been looking in inflammation and disease, and we can see that the mucus bacteria change very, very quickly in response to inflammation, whereas the poo bacteria don't change at all. So if you're wanting to look at things that might be important for our health, 
we might need to be thinking again about where we're getting those bacteria from. And we still don't know about all the other guys in the microbiome, the viruses, the fungi, the parasites, etc. So, what can you do if you want to be healthier as regards your microbiome? People who live long, healthy, robust lives seem to have a very varied and diverse microbiome. People who live very kind of frail lives, they're not very well as they get older, or they have a lot of inflammatory conditions, seem to have a much less diverse microbiome, much less variety in the species that are found there. So that suggests that variety is a good thing. What can you do to have a varied gut microbiome? Well, basically, all you need to do is have a varied diet, because the diet is the most important thing that shapes our microbiome. So a diet that's rich in prebiotic foods, pulses, fruits, vegetables, you want sources of protein, you want sources of carbohydrate, you, want, you can even sort of supplement it with probiotics like yogurts or fermented foods. But what you really need is a good range of foods. And what this goes to show is that we are what we eat. Thank you very much.